You are listening to History Man, a platform for historians, authors, and museum directors to tell their stories of the American Revolution, walk in the footsteps of heroes, and proclaim freedom reigns. On today's episode, we're with Bernard George, historian, retired New Bern City planner, and author of an article called Sporting the Cause of Freedom, the Black Experience in Revolutionary Craven County. His work has been featured on NCTV and other programs around North Carolina. So welcome, Bernard. Thank you. Welcome. Bernard, we're actually in New Bern, North Carolina, your hometown, right? Yes. Where the sun rises over the inner coast and sets over the coastal plain. Beautiful area. Yes, it is. So before we get started, um, Bernard, we want to give a shout out to a couple of our affiliates. One of them is uh, southerncampaigns.org which specializes in peer review articles and research on the American Revolution, especially in the Southern campaigns. And the other is uh, the Cultural and Heritage Museums of York County, uh, including Brattonsville, which is a historical site of the Battle of Huck's Defeat. So Bernard, you have done quite a bit of research on the Revolutionary War, and you have uh, quite a number of friends who are tied to the SAR locally here, and it just happens to be one of the only, if not the only, black member SARs in the country. Is that correct? That's correct. That's phenomenal to me, and uh, I've, I've been excited about getting up and, and hearing what you have to say and the, and the history around uh, the militia here in this area. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'm going to sit back and let you tell our listeners uh, what you have researched. Well, we're real excited about the rich history that surrounds this area. The great historian uh, John Franklin said that New Bern, Craven County, Eastern North Carolina has some of the most comprehensive African-American history in the nation. And uh, we are just proud to mine some of that rich history that lies here untouched, that has, that has lain here for generations and generations and not been exposed to the public. So I've taken it on as a personal project of mine to uh, publicize, to research and publicize these, these historical legacies that our forefathers have left us here. My family can trace its history back here in Craven County for over 200 years, going on 300 years. We came here in the early 1700s. And we moved here from Tidewater, Virginia, where we were free blacks. And we moved here along with several other families, the Diggers, the the Copes, the Carters, the Godettes, and Johnsons. And we came here just like many of the other European white families that moved into North Carolina because of the undeveloped land potential that was here the low cost of land, and just the future that it presented to those who felt that Virginia was too crowded or too uh, restricted for them. And for my relatives, it was too restrictive as free African Americans, and I must say that I could trace my family history all the way back to the 1640s with our first George who came here over a slave ship, but he was able to earn his freedom by the 1780s, purchased his freedom for 10,000 pounds of tobacco, and the rest is history. Uh, He, along with other blacks during this period, made a living there in Tidewater, Virginia. But unfortunately, uh, the arms, the long reach of racism reached into their homes and presented many obstacles that restricted them for, you know, really uh, grabbing a piece of the American dream. Uh, African Americans, free African Americans during that early period there in Virginia were subjected to more and more restrictive laws preventing their marriage, uh, requiring exorbitant um, bonds for them to marry or to be bonded out, and even eventually uh, requiring that they leave the state. And this was not only on African-Americans, but on Native Americans, too. So my family, 
along with others I mentioned, moved here to eastern North Carolina and settled in eastern Craven County and Carteret County in an area called Harlow. This is a neighbor. This is a neighborhood, a community that's over 300 years old. Wow. I come from at least seven generations that were born and raised right here in New Bern. So for the most part, uh, I tell many others that, uh, you know, we got off the, the boat here in many ways. And uh, my presence here, my family's presence here, trumps the presence of most other immigrants to this country due to their early appearance here. My family, I'm proud to say, uh, is included in the first census this country had in 1790. You'll find the Georges of Craven County there. In fact, uh, when we purchased land here, a great-grandmother of mine, several times removed, sold land to her sons. And in 1752, she sold her son um, 100 acres in, in uh, Craven County. And uh, we also had others to sell and buy land, such that in that period, there were only about three quarters of a million African Americans in this country. At the time of the American Revolution, people find it hard to believe but the population in this country, uh, African Americans comprise 19% of the population of this country. And uh, this is in the census figures. Uh, my family, uh, many of the men, enlisted in the local militia uh, during the French and Indian Wars and protect their communities. So it was just a natural step for them when this country declared its freedom, its independence, that they should fight for the American Revolution, for the Patriots. And that's what they did. Mm -hmm. well, that is a, a fantastic heritage, one that I am envious of. Uh, I know that, that probably most families out there have a hard time uh, tracing back their heritage, their ancestors uh, back through the, the public records and such. Uh, but you have been able to do that through your research, for, through uh, purchases of land and, and the other records that are on file here in one of the oldest counties in the state, correct? That's correct. So tell us a little bit about those core families, especially in the Revolution when they signed up. Uh, did they participate in any battles? They served in several campaigns, a few of the major campaigns during the American Revolution. As such, this community that I mentioned, the Harlow community, was recently recognized in 2016 by the Sons of the American Revolution as having contributed probably the highest percentage per capita of soldiers to the American cause for a community that small. Uh, there were 14 patriots that came from that little community. And uh, frankly, the American Revolution is a, uh, is a complex story. You know, we have the Loyalists and of course the Patriots, but then in the middle, you have the African Americans. 19% mm -hmm. of the population of this country and most of them, 90%, 95% of them were slaves. So when, uh, so when uh, Lord Dunmore promised the enslaved that freedom, and uh, I think it was about 1776, our commanding chief of the Patriots earlier had banned the enlistment of African Americans, both free and enslaved. But when Lord Dunmore made that offer, to the enslaved, to come over to the British side and to receive freedom and many other promises, they flocked to his ships there in uh, Virginia. And this put pressure on our commanding chief, General George Washington, to change his stance and to offer um, enlistment opportunities for free blacks. 
So that's why my community, the Harlow community, and where my relatives were living, which was basically a majority free community. And um, let me speak a bit about that community. That community actually uh, was triracial. Okay. The African Americans, both free and enslaved. There were Native Americans, uh, remnants of the Tuscaroans that were uh, defeated and uh, sent out of here, marched out of here in 1713 and 1714. And of course, there were also uh, uh, white slave owners and settlers who lived in that community. And they all appeared to have gotten along very well. And I read in your article where you were talking about the background of uh, Newburn and the artisans and the merchants there, and the black community was very big in the uh, in the artisan community, and the building of the Tryon Palace. How how does that economy match the economy of Harlow? Was Harlow more agrarian? Harlow was agrarian, but it was independent. Very independent. You know, during this period, the colonial period and the early national period, there were communities of free blacks, population pockets throughout the state, mainly during, uh, in the eastern part of the state. And these communities communicated with each other. They intermarried with each other. And they brought news to each other. Uh, uh, as I've often led to share with people, there are two very different types of slavery. One is urban slavery, okay. where a person is much more treated as a personal servant, and therefore you're working uh, very intimately in that relationship, and uh, the, the person takes on human characteristics, and there is more of an opportunity for those who are enslaved in those situations to be able to go out and earn a living because in an urban setting, there are so many um, crafts, so many uh, uh, professions, jobs that require skills that these slaves had. And they were able to go into those jobs, earn money, and purchase their freedom and purchase the freedom of wives and children. Well, in a um, agrarian culture, uh, 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 rural slavery, that's where you get a man and you work him like a mule, a mule or chicken. In fact, we know that their slave schedule during uh, the antebellum period, uh, the census itself did not include the names of slaves. Uh, no information. They were listed just like chicken and hogs and pigs and, and, and just by their sex and their age. But as free African Americans, they were included in the census, in the censuses that were taken, and therefore they could be identified. That's why I can trace my own family history. So the militia drill area, where was that down in Harlow? Uh, each county was required to uh, recruit a certain number of volunteers or draft. Yeah, so they drilled up here in Newburn. Abner Neal was the lo name of the local militia, and uh, several of my relatives were in that militia. And then there were those who were attached to other regiments who marched out of North Carolina, went up as far as New York and Pennsylvania, and fought with the uh, with the national troops. In fact, in your article, you were talking about um, the people from Harlow that registered or that joined the revolution. Uh, and I think it's best for me just to, to quote that article uh, under the tradition of service continues section. You said that Isaac Carter, Joshua Carter, William Dove, Isaac Perkins of Harlow appeared to have started their revolutionary war service in one of two special regiments of militia created in early May 1776 in anticipation of a rumored British invasion along the Cape Fear River. 
though some accounts claim the men served under Major John Tillman of Fort Hancock during the winter of 1778. Due to the timing involved, it is more likely they served in the 1st Battalion of Militia under Tillman in an expedition to Wilmington that lasted June to August 1776. After building a large barracks complex in Wilmington, these militia units were disbanded on August 13, 1776. And then when the war and the draft came around, when uh, you went on to say that when North Carolina General Assembly initiated a draft in 1777, all men ages 16 to 50 were required to serve or find an able-bodied man to serve as a substitute. No color qualifications were noted. Eligible men from Harlow quickly responded. The following glimpses into their lives are based on accounts provided by award-winning genealogist Paul Hennig in his work, Free African Americans of Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina from the Colonial Period to about 1820. Martin Black, Isaac Perkins, William Dove, and Isaac Carter each enlisted for three years in Captain Silas Stevenson's company, of the 10th North Carolina Regiment, then under the command of Colonel Abraham Shepard. Black and Perkins enlisted in New Bern on May 16, 1777, followed by Dove on June 14, and Carter on September 1st. When North Carolina troops encamped at Valley Forge in the summer of 1778, four of the state's regiments were reduced to a cadre status, and three regiments were disbanded leaving only the 1st and 2nd Regiments in full strength. The four men were then assigned to the 2nd North Carolina Regiment under the command of Colonel John Patton. Perkins and Carter were assigned to Captain Clement Hall's company, Dove to Captain John Craddock's company, and Black to Captain Benjamin Coleman's company. On May 16, 1779, Black fought in a skirmish against British troops near West Point, New York, and on June 20th, 1779, he was a part of a highly trained and hand-picked group of Continental soldiers that successfully assaulted and captured a British outpost at Stony Point, New York. Dove fought in the Battle of Monmouth on June 28, 1778, and then the Battle of Stony Point on July 15th, 1778. In November 1779, the 2nd North Carolina Regiment was transferred to the Southern Department and marched south to Charleston, South Carolina, to help defend that city. On May 12, 1780, the 2nd North Carolina Regiment surrendered 301 men to the British Army at the fall of Charleston, including Black, Perkins, and Dove. Black and Perkins managed to escape, but Black was soon recaptured. He remained in Charleston in Captain Benjamin Coleman's company of the 2nd North Carolina Regiment until a prisoner exchange and release in December 1782 in Charleston. One of the things that we have to realize is that African Americans have a very similar history in all the wars, in just about every war that the United States fought up to World War II, in which initially African Americans were denied the right to fight or to enlist. They were banned from military service. And then as this country's military needs increased, that ban was lifted. And at first they only allowed free African Americans to enlist. And then again, as the need further increased, they even allowed slaves. And we find that with the American Revolution the War of 1812 to a degree or to a more limited degree. And then uh, with the um, uh, Civil War, where uh, uh, approximately 200,000 black men enlisted, they were at first banned also until this country's uh, military needs reached such a critical point that uh, African Americans were allowed to enlist and they fought admirably. What would you want people to take from this Harlow story? Well, here in, in New Bern, and out of Trine Palace, where I serve as a governor appointed commissioner to the uh, museum there, that we have a favorite saying. We have one history and many stories. 
And that's what intrigues me so much about history is that everybody has a different story. You just can't paint Americans with one broad brush, with the stroke of a broad brush, no matter how you try. This story that I have, I don't think it's that unique. I think, I think what's unique is that we have been able to do the research, our earlier research than others. But as more and more students of history uh, receive an education and go out into the field and do research, more and more we'll begin to understand the rich tapestry of history that has been woven here in America. What a beautiful way to put it. Well, let me ask you this, Bernard. What does liberty mean to you? Liberty means what the Constitution says is so beautifully written that we have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And liberty is the freedom to pursue happiness, to pursue a livelihood, to pursue and reach your potential. That's what liberty means to me. And at one point, as we know, African Americans have not been allowed to reach their full potential. We still have some restrictions today. But thank God, America is getting better. Sometimes we take uh, one step forward and two back. But we're constantly moving forward. And times are changing. Times are getting better. And thank God for younger people who have a sense of justice, who have a sense of just what it is to be a, a, a human being and to respect other humans in this uh, world culture in which we live in today. Or tell, tell us a little bit about what they would find at the Tryon Palace. Tryon Palace is a reconstruction of the first state capital on the grounds here, here in New Bern. It was built around 1756, and it housed Governor Tryon and his family. Uh, try, that reconstructed uh, site, fully reconstructed, and now it has a, a $60 million museum on it also, captures the, the, the history and heritage of Eastern North Carolina. Uh, it has a one. It has wonderful exhibits throughout the museum itself on the life and times as it involved in Eastern North Carolina from the time of its early colonial period until even up to the present. And uh, we understand that there is one history and many stories, and we explore all of those stories. That the, the, the uh, museum itself is a teaching and research institution also. We have uh, many lectures and opportunities for education there at the facility itself. And then it uh, draws visitors from around the world, from across this state and around this world, as they come and, and, and seek to better understand the life and culture of Eastern North Carolina. How would they reach you? We can be reached at um, tryandpalace.com. You can also reach Sharon C. Bryant. She's the African-American Outreach Coordinator at Tryand Palace. Her number is 252-639-3592. And she can be reached at sharon.bryant at ncdcr.gov. And we would be glad to entertain any discussions. We have a full size uh, uh, reenactment group of uh, colonial patriots. We also have a full size reenactment group of Civil War reenactors, U.S. color troops, the 35th United States color troops, which was one of the very first all black units that was organized during the Civil War. And uh, we, have re uh, we have over 
15 reenactors. We travel along the uh, east coast of, North, uh, of uh, the United States from as far away as Florida all the way up to Pennsylvania in reenactments and sharing the story of those cre courageous African Americans who have fought and supported this country through the dare times of its military engagements. Well, Bernard, it was a pleasure talking with you today. I think you put it correctly when you talk about the tapestry of the United States, and everyone has a story that adds to that tapestry. I know that uh, our listeners have enjoyed listening to the story here, and uh, I look forward to hearing more stories about your group and, and how they uh, were tied to the American Revolution. And I just want to add that the Isaac Carter Sons of the American Revolution, which is the only post of African Americans across this country, uh, SAR, it is alive and well there and hollow. And um, we are just excited that our forefathers were able to have such a profound impact on the American Revolution and that impact can be shared with the public today when at a time it was totally swept under the rug and not clearly uh, you know explained or exposed we take this time to share it with, with uh, students and with younger people and older people and gives them a sense of uh, belonging, a sense of history, a sense of destiny, and a sense of purpose that this indeed is our country. We all are in this boat together. <laughs>